Welcome everybody to the Maintaining Active Directory with Coverland webinar. This week we're going to talk about uh, pretty much exactly that, Maintaining Active Directory. I'm Ezra Charm, joined by Victor Cruz from our support team, and uh, we're going to walk you through some of the features that are included in Coverland that will help you maintain Active Directory. And I guess, um, you know, Victor is here as a uh, uh, you know, IT expert, and um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about why maintaining Active Directory might be important. So I'll kick it right to you, Victor. Uh, why should we care about maintaining Active Directory? Um, I think the main thing about maintaining Active Directory is just really stale accounts and, and being up to par with your maintenance and the incoming and outgoing of employees and user accounts. Um, that's usually a huge um, issue for us IT guys is just always having stale accounts and especially computer accounts um, because Active Directory doesn't really good, do a good job of cleaning up after itself. So. Right, so there is some kind of work involved in going and cleaning that up and I was actually watching a, saw a story on the news this week about uh, I guess at the State Department or something like that, they realized they have tons of unused email accounts and that sort of thing and that's obviously a security uh, Concern. It's these accounts sit out there. They probably have expired or old passwords, and we just want to make sure that uh, those aren't sitting out there. Um, how about some uh, other reasons aside from the security reason to make sure we don't have these inactive objects? I know we talked about um, just in terms of running reports from that moment on. Is it just as simple as there's less objects to query now, so our reports are gonna run nicer once we kind of clean up? Yeah, it's that, but also being able to see where you may have some security flaws that you may need to implement um, in place. For example, you know, like password age, to be able to see if, you know, how long a specific account has had a password, um, and if it's been there for a long time, because, you know, the longer the password stays there, the easier it is that, you know, it can be used maliciously against you. So that's just one of the, the small things that you can use. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I think we have uh, some good ideas for just uh, quick reports to cover. And um, we're not going to do the normal intro on Government, other than to say that uh, for the purposes of doing everything or almost everything we're doing today, we don't even need agents installed. And why is that? How was Government communicating with Active Directory so that this is totally agentless? Yeah, so Government, um, when it comes to speaking to Active Directory, it does it via uh, basic LDAP requests. It really does it. And that's just the way, that's the language that, you know, Active Directory domain controllers speak. Um, and it allows you to go ahead and tap into um, the Active Directory catalog where all of this information is located. So it doesn't require an agent to uh, be installed on your Active Directory controller since LDAP is, you know, a default of any Windows agent. Cool. So um, I think uh, first in our agenda here, we were talking about uh, expired, unused, or inactive accounts. Mm -hmm. And so for something like that, we would jump into Government scope actions, because here we're targeting multiple accounts, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we're trying to produce a report of ones that are unused, expired, inactive, disabled. Um, so we've already built this out, but we'll definitely walk through it with you guys and, and show you exactly the pieces that are in place and how we can produce these reports really quickly and nicely. And then some of the stuff that we can do afterwards as a result of gathering this information. So obviously, you know, a report is only as good as something that you can do with it. So uh, once we have these groups of expired, unused, inactive, or disabled AD accounts, we may want to take some remediative action. We may want to apply some configuration changes, something like that. <clears throat> so uh, we'll start off with expired accounts. And um, uh, tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here. Here we're just basically querying um, some basic information on um, a specific user account in which we selected the scope as the user. And then um, we're selecting specific properties that are directly on the Active Directory account itself. Um, so as you can see here, we're detecting the first, we're requesting the first name, the last name, um, when the account is set to expire, and or if it's if it's actually expired, should we say, and when um, it's actually set to expire by the timestamp. And then what we're doing down here is we're filtering out exactly what which accounts we want. And in this case, we just want accounts that are actually expired. So 
the, the idea here is that whatever we put in this bottom section, we're only going to return results where that is true. So in this case, we only want to see accounts where uh, the account expired is equal to true. And so we just added that condition. And to add that condition, it's really straightforward. You click this add remove button, set user condition, uh, move down to user account information, grab that ex account expired, and then expired and then uh, where that's equal to true. Uh, to add whatever columns I want in my report, it's again reporting on user property and just checking off whatever I want included in my report. And now the same is true for these other reports. Here we're looking at accounts that are set to disabled, and you can see based on our condition here that uh, we are showing uh, where account disabled is equal to true. And then our last report is gonna be unused accounts, and unused accounts are very, very simply accounts that have no successful logouts, right? Yeah, and another thing that we're doing here is um, <clears throat> over here we're, we're basically um, caddy, how, how, do you, how do you say it when you caddy, when you caddy actions back to back? Right. The same, but you're caddying them basically. So Governance will execute these actions in order. So if you put expired accounts first, it'll make sure to perform this report action first and go in. Uh, to the next one. It's a sequence, time. I guess. A sequence. Okay. So uh, let's go and run this and let's just see what we get. And we've consolidated all these three reports into one. Um, and then we just uh, will apply some, some quick sorting to see what's what. So I'm just going to go and run this and you'll see we will run through an entire OU of users here. And um, <clears throat> and uh, as soon as that finishes up processing, um, um, we will uh, we'll take a look at it. <clears throat> and so my report here opened on my second monitor. Let me just drag it over and uh, just refresh it quickly so we can get what we're looking at. So here we'll see if we just sort by account expires, um, we'll see that we have this one expired account. And we expired him specifically for this webinar so that we can return a result. And you can see that our account expiration was last Tuesday. Um, all these other accounts are unused accounts. They have no logons except for uh, one disabled account sitting out here as well. And by the way, we support multiple report formats. You can export this into Excel or CSV or text file or something like that. So this way you can uh, you know, uh, supply it to auditors or whatever else you need to do. And um, we can also expand this out so we can get a quick scroll through of all, and, you know, we're in a lab here, so we're going to have quite a few expired accounts or, or uh, actually unused. unused accounts. So now once we produce this report, we may want to decide like, hey, I have all these either expired or unused or inactive or disabled accounts sitting out there. I want to make sure that I don't have any of these security concerns that you're talking about. So um, I guess... You know, just off the top of your head, and I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot, but uh, you know, what are some things that we would do to these accounts if we found that they were sitting out there? Um, so I guess what type um, of remediation would you think of first? And obviously, an account that's you know disabled, we don't have to do much. There's no access. But. Yeah, I mean, well, it really depends on what you know your preferences are as your Active Directory, you know, domain administrator. For example, there are some admins that just basically have an OU that they set up specific rules that if an account is moved to that OU, then it'll automatically set it to disabled, reset the password, and do these specific actions. Um, but that requires a lot more configuration, a lot more going, you know, setting up either a GPO for that OU and setting those settings up. So in your, in this case, we would want to do all of that with Governor, which would be the first thing is move them to a completely different OU. Okay, so let's, uh, we're not actually gonna do this work in this example, but uh, which one should I pick here? The expired, disabled, or unused? Um, I would say expired. Unused is probably our unused, biggest yeah. vulnerability, yeah. right? Yeah. I just thought so. So um, just to give you some ideas of some of the capabilities that are within Goverland on what you can do once you produce a report of, of these accounts that are considered risky or, or unused or whatever it is, I can click on add remove and then I can execute any type of user actions. And some of the really cool things here are things like removing group membership. So obviously this really helps us make sure that this unused account isn't part of some, you know, uh, domain admin group or something like that. Um, we can also do things like move the object to uh, to an inactive OU. We can we can uh, do a whole bunch of other stuff as well. 
um, and obviously expire the password if we need to. Um, and that, that for expiring the password, we would just set a user property, move down to a user account information, and then just set the password to expired. And uh, here we can just show you what that looks like right here. Just set that to true. So this way, uh, you know, we're now running reports, and we have um, we, you know, we're taking the results of those reports, and we're deciding what what we want to do you know, as a follow-up. And obviously, uh, once you have this set up, you can define a schedule and just maybe run this once a day. Maybe decide that, you know, you are going to run this daily at 9 a.m. So every day at 9 a.m., you're going to look for accounts that match this criteria. And then whatever actions you had added in, um, those will be performed as well. Yeah, and we literally just walked through turning Governan, which, you know, out of box is an ad hoc tool, which doesn't come with any actions out of box, but you have to build them. But once you build those actions, you can automatically automate them. So we went from an ad hoc to an, to automated. an automated dot. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, okay. it's awesome. So um, another example here would be uh, user or computer accounts with no activity in the past number of days. And this is kind of interesting because these don't fall into our category of expired, disabled, unused, right? Because these are accounts that have activity, they're enabled, but maybe they're not, uh, maybe they're out of compliance because they have no activity in the last 90 days. Or maybe you just want to be aware of accounts that have no activity in the, in the last 90 days. Maybe somebody from HR forgot to tell you that a certain employee left. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these things, crazily enough, happen all the time, right? <laughs> so uh, let's take a look at what we can do here. Um, so here we're going to look at, again, user accounts. And you can see that I defined a scope. And I did this as well. I defined a scope or a target of users. And in here, uh, you can define your scope based on a mix and match of everything here. Here I just grabbed an entire OU, my Miami IT users OU. But uh, it's completely integrated with, with Active Directory. So you can just scroll through and grab uh, whatever users you want to target. Um, and then I can combine it with my action module here. Here is, again, a report where I'm bringing in the NT account name, uh, first name, last name, and last logon stand. Uh, the thing that we do that's creative here is in our condition. So in here, we've set a dy dynamic value condition. And so what a dynamic value condition is, is it lets you evaluate against, um, against values that are uh, contained in that object. Is, is, is that how you would say that? So. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at something called, you know, of current date and time, so just today, uh, less a time span of 90 days, and it's a little bit weird on how you put that together, but you do a time span of one day times 90 days. And if I hit the insert button here on your keyboard, you can see that these are some of the conditions you can evaluate. And this is available to you against machines also. So you can really kind of build out a really precise definition, I guess. Or yeah, something. basically what these are, the, these are just all the variables that Governland can, can basically parse from the object that you're querying. So it's all verbatim, the same exact type of objects that you're querying. Can, in, in this space, you can just think of it, you can think of them as variables. So you're just telling Governland, um, you know, use these variables using these actual operators that you have. So in this case, we use the current and date and time variable. Right. Minus one day. So we have something here that calculates 90 days. Um, it's just current date and time less 90 days. So it's 90 days ago. And you're looking for people who are le whose last timestamp is less than 90 days ago. So previous to 90 days ago. I know it's like these double logic things. But once you get the hang of it, you get the hang of it. And uh, it's all, uh, it could be a little bit of trial and error just to produce the report. But you see, we have no actions yet. We're just producing the report. So running this, it's not going to cause any harm. We're just going to make sure we get the result and set we're looking for. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to hit OK here. And I'm going to hit OK here. And again, these can always be run on a schedule or on a recurring basis. And we'll just run this one real quick and just take a look at um, all of, our user, all of our users who have no activity in the past 90 days. <clears throat> Did that run? Mm -hmm. I guess it's opening. And uh, you know, the next thing we're going to look at is a password age report. Here it goes. Um, is a password age report. And uh, then we will move on to our next use cases. So here you can see I have a lot of users who haven't logged in at all. So obviously, they match that criteria. But then I have a couple here that have definitely not logged in in the past 90 days. Let's see how quickly we can switch over to an HTML. 
you want. Sure, and uh, Victor's mentioning uh, uh, the, all the different report formats we support. So you saw an Excel format, we can do a table format or a data sheet format. So if you want just like a little cleaner, nicer report, and by the way, these can also automatically be emailed out to your auditors. So uh, you can have it just drop into an email or drop onto a file share or something like that. This way really like you can really fully automate some of your compliance reporting. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, here we'll take a look at password age. So in this case, uh, again, defining my scope, I'm just targeting the uh, same group of users, my Miami IT users, and I am running a report of last, lo last logon timestamp and password age. Those are the two things I want included in my report. And by the way, that's what this section is. This is telling you what is included in your report. And down here, we've set a, um, we've set our condition to only show us users that have a password age of greater than 90, right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're, we're, we're only looking for users who are out of compliance in this case. And here we have a great use case to talk about, right? And what's our great use case here? It's these service accounts, right? So we all remember to enforce our password policies on our users because that's what we do as responsible IT people. But uh, you know, with great power, I guess, comes great responsibility. And sometimes with great power, you find ways to do shortcuts and you end up with service accounts that have like really old passwords. How big of a problem is that? It's huge because, you know, changing service accounts, passwords can bring, you can force an IT guy to have to bring the whole company down. <laughs> <laughs> and to bring the whole company down, you know. There's not. an explanation that comes with that, I guess. So. <laughs> Yeah. So at least let's be aware of what's going on. So here's a great way where we can literally target every user object, um, you know, all those service accounts as well, and just run a report and show us last logon and password age, and then decide what follow-up actions we're going to take. So uh, let's run this again, and we'll run it in this visible mode so we can see what's going on. And um, here we're again scanning through, you know, several hundred um, uh, Active Directory objects, and we're spitting out our report here, uh, which is showing us password age, and it includes that last logon timestamp. So you can get an idea of when the last time this user signed in uh, was, and how old is their password. And obviously, you know, we support all those report formats, and you can sort this in every single way. And now, once we've produced this report, if we're feeling like bringing the company down, we can even do things like. Uh, you know, expire all of these passwords and force these users to uh, to reset to uh, reset their password at next logon, right? So, um, some really nice ways of targeting multiple users, computers, other AD objects, and 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 uh, running reports on them, and then adding in those bits of automation that are making sure that our environment is staying nice and tidy and stuff like that, and. Um, you know, obviously we didn't go through it, but once we found these uh, user or computer accounts with no activity, we can also automatically move them to different OUs and, and uh, remove group memberships or do whatever else we need to do. So that takes us to, you know, this is like a, we've inherited a messy Active Directory and now we've found nice ways, very simple ways to clean it up. But now let's go to the next use case, which is how do we keep it clean from here on in? So, and that's just developing good practices. Um, <clears throat> uh, so a uh, quick question before we move on. On these user reports, can they also show which computer name they logged into as well as the IP address? Uh, you want to address how nicely we track user login history? Yeah, um, you definitely can do that. Um, Governant has a proprietary feature called uh, login workstation detection, also known as Fast Connect. And basically, um, we are able, you're able to feed Governant a username, and Governant can automatically figure out exactly what machine they have logged into, or they are currently logged into as well. Um, in which you'll be able to see here now. So, and we'll just take a we'll take a quick look at that. Um, Okay. Um, and you can see right here in my account information against this user, I have this login history report. This is not a Windows log. This is actually a Goverland log, and it's showing you everywhere where this user logs in and out of over a course of time. And I'm pretty sure I can add IP address to this, right? Or yes. So basically, you, once um, you can, if you want, go, go ahead and show the, the login workstation. Sure. 
So you just double click and as you can see, he's an IT guy. He's logged into two machines, but very simply in the action or any action that we have, for example, here, you can in these user actions that you see here, for example, execute or report user property, you'll be able to see that we have a logged in computers property for this user. And it's gonna go ahead and use that proprietary logged in workstation detection to find exactly where he's logged in and then simply execute whatever type of action you're looking against that machine. In this case, you want the machine name, which would be NT account name, and then you would go down to uh, network adapters. Yeah, we can just search for it as well, right? But uh, Go to network adapters and then IP info and then IP addresses. Sure. And that's it. And you can even, if you like, from there, um, force log off that person as well. So if you end up terminating the user, you can. Well, that's what we're going to cover next. And, th and that's uh, some, some other stuff around employee termination so, uh, and user provision. So, um, and then obviously, great segue right there. So uh, right here, we're, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're down in Miami, and we had an unfortunate thing happen to us this week, and that uh, Dwayne Wade left the Miami Heat, right? Yeah, so we're sure. all very sad about that. But uh, um, he left on good terms, and, uh, and um, you know, while we're sad to see him go, we're, there's no hate, right? I'm, sad, I'm speaking for maybe too many people here. But uh, we are going to terminate Dwayne Wade today. So Dwayne Wade is going to is going to be leaving our organization. So uh, let's take a look at Dwayne Wade first, and we can see his account information. We can see, um, you know, what what he has access to, his user groups, his account is is enabled, and all that. And so what we're going to actually do is we're going to define a termination policy for us to use at Coverland, and and this is a great thing to have. And we talk about this all the time, and it's because, you know, your employees. You terminate employees 4.30 or later on a Friday. You, you usually have plans that night, and instead you end up staying late and running compliance reports and, and jumping through hoops instead of you know uh, doing what you had planned to do. And it's all because somebody walked into HR and, and, and resigned or because HR had to let somebody go. So uh, what we can do instead is sit down with HR in advance and say, Let's just come up with a plan. Let's define the checklist. And you probably have a checklist already, but uh, let's stop working off the checklist and let's automate a little. And so the sky's the limit here, but I'll show you just what we have set up. Uh, and we are gonna run through this termination procedure here. And all these actions are gonna run in order. So we're first gonna run a group membership report. Maybe we wanna supply this to our auditors and we wanna say, hey, you know, uh, um, uh, this is this is these were this users groups, but you know this is gone now, or we just want to confirm or whatever we want to. We want to log the user off all their current sessions. This happens in real time, so just make sure this user is not logged in anywhere. We won't want to run a login history report. I don't think Dwayne Wade ever showed up to work here, so uh, um, there might not be anything in that report. We want to do our Active Directory cleanup, and this is again so we avoid. Uh, having to run these Active Directory seeking clean reports in the future. We can just in advance, anytime an employee gets terminated, let's make sure we set the account to disabled, we expire the password, we move the user to the terminated user zone. Now. And then we're going to run our, we're going to remove all this user's group memberships. So um, these actions are going to fire in order. And uh, really, whatever you want to do in terms of terminating employees in your organization, you can decide what you want to do. So uh, the sky's the limit here. We talk to schools who go and delete gigabytes of rolling profiles because all their students turn over at the end of the year. Uh, we talk to other organizations that export users' mailboxes as a PSD or move files and folders around. And actually, file and folder manipulation is the topic of next week's discussion. So keep an eye out for that invite. Um, so uh, here, we're just going to run through this process. So again, you can define whatever process you want. The tools are all in there. You kind of piece it together using the wizard, and we're happy to help with whatever you need. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to run this terminate employee process, and it's going to execute now against Dwayne Wade, and uh, it's going to tell us that all actions have been executed successfully. And we'll pop open our report, and again, that user login history report doesn't appear because um, Dwayne never logged in. So uh, we do get that group membership report, and we'll jump back into our Goverland console here, and we'll just refresh our screen, and we can see that Dwayne is now gone. And it's because one of those steps was to uh, move Dwayne into terminated users. 
And you can see that's where Dwayne is now. Now we jump into account information here. We can see that his password's expired, his account is disabled, and groups have been removed. So we've done all of our Active Directory cleanup, and we're really not going to have to worry about this user the next time around. Mm -hmm. I want to answer that question. Is, sure, there's um, another question. Go ahead. The question is, does this integrate with Exchange servers so that I can forward their email to another employee? Um, Governance does not directly integrate with Exchange server, but um, you can push a script that can do, that already has that action to forward someone's email to another employee, um, and you could just throw it into that same action itself. Um, so the answer to that is we just push out a PowerShell script against uh, along with that same action, and we can obviously show an example of this. But currently, um, yeah, there isn't no direct integration based on you know the dynamic data that Coverline queries to be able to forward it to Exchange. So. And if you're interested in some of the stuff we do on Exchange, we do have a recorded demo where we monitor Exchange. We set up all kinds of custom alerts, and we can send that to you uh, after this. Uh, this is completed. Uh, we're also going to provision a new user now. So now that uh, you know we've we've brought in Dwayne Wade's replacement, and uh, and so we are going to uh, set up this new user, um, and uh, this is going to be our new Mr. Miami. So uh, hopefully he doesn't exist in Active Directory here, but uh, let's just take a look. <clears throat> I apologize for the basketball references, but it's either this or Game of Thrones, and I think this is better. So, <laughs> so, so here we have Hassan Whiteside. He's a new Mr. Miami, and so we're going to provision this user for the first time. Now, uh, talk to me about RSAT tools, because I know you keep saying this, and I guess if I'm attending this webinar, I should know what RSAT tools are, but I have no idea. So, <laughs> so RSAT tools is the remote server administration tool set that um, allows you to, as an IT guy, to install the same Active Directory tools that you get on an Active Directory domain controller, but on your local you know, Windows operating system. So in this case, Governan automatically detects if you have RSAT tools installed on your local machine. And if you do, it'll automatically populate the exact form um, here uh, for user creation or object creation. So it's just kind of an ease of use for all of you Active Directory administrators. Yeah, because you know the guise of Governance is to try to keep it as familiar as possible to your standard day-to-day -day things that you see every day. For example, like the new user creation form or the terms that are used. You know, we try you know our best to just keep it exactly how you would see it in Windows. Um, and that's just one of the little examples of how we strive to do that. So I guess what you're seeing here is kind of us picking up on the fact that our set tools is installed and mm -hmm. hooking into that. I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here I filled out the beginning of Hassan's uh, uh, new user object. I'm going to hit next. Just create a, a password for him uh, just because we have a uh, what do we have that forces me to create a password again? Password policy. <laughs> password mm -hmm. policy. Domain password policy. So uh, here we go. We're creating Hassan. We're going to hit finish and Hassan has been created. So now we need to provision Hassan. So right now Hassan is almost like a empty shell of a user, right? He has no groups, he has no home directory, he has no, nothing really, right? Exactly. So uh, we're gonna run through some steps to automate provisioning. And here what's really nice is that we eliminate the need to uh, sit in front of Active Directory users and computers and click around a lot. How much time have you spent doing stuff like that? <sighs> <laughs> as much as I can tell you, it's just <laughs> a okay. gasp. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's take a look at uh, the steps we're going to go through today. And um, obviously, there's uh, um, whatever this looks like to you, you can create for yourself. And you can also create multiples of these. So I can have one for an IT user, one for a sales user, maybe one for an exec user. The nice thing is you create just the shell or you can import a list of users and then just run these against them and have all of your kind of checklists performed at once. So in our case, we're gonna map a drive first. And uh, the cool thing that we're doing on this, uh, on this uh, map a drive here is that we're inserting the user account so that we can, this, this is universal. It's gonna run against any new user that we create. Yeah, and, and just as a quick example, you know, in Active Directory, you usually put percent, username percent, but in this case, you're using Goverland's, um, you know, dynamic information to be able to set those. <clears throat> um, 
Okay, the next step here is we're gonna set the, the account information. So the company, department, and email. We're gonna set the address and phone number. We are going to uh, add group memberships. And this one, uh, just to add multiple group memberships, I just come in here and just click on it again and I put in my uh, next group. So I can add another one here and it'll just list them list down, right? So I'm going to make sure he's provisioned with all of his groups. And then we're going to run a quick verification report. Let's make sure that everything happened the way it was supposed to happen, everything looks right. And here's the, another really nice piece is we can make sure that these actions are all happening correctly. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> and so uh, let's go ahead and provision Hassan, Hassan right very quickly. And uh, we're just going to double click on that, let it run through our provision a new user. It says all actions have been executed successfully and we'll pop open our report. It shows us uh, his, his user account information is complete. We've avoided clicking through Active Directory users and computers. Uh, we even uh, created his home directory with his username there. And then um, we see that his groups are created. Now, um, uh, tell me some of the other things I can do as part of this provisioning steps. Um, in terms of, um, what do you mean, what other steps that we can do? Is, is there anything else I can add in here or any, you know, can I, or is this pretty much what provisioning would look like? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, and with the case of the live question here that he said, uh, so a script could be used here to add them to the Exchange server. Um, it would be, it's, it, it's not as direct as placing a script directly under this user because we're using custom actions, um, which we definitely should answer that here. Um, so when it comes to, you know, if you'd want to push a specific script against uh, an Exchange server, you would have to have, make sure you have that script already created that it's going to create a specific user for you. Um, and you would push that scope action against the Exchange server. But in terms of integrating the script with that username and all that, that you wouldn't be able to do. That would be have to be manual. So when it comes to Exchange, it's not, and provisioning, um, we don't really work in that space. Uh, another question here is, can these, be, can these actions be exported and imported into other Goverland instances? And this is a great question, because um, all Goverland objects, and our, our objects, you can actually see them on our start page. Um, it's this icon right here. Uh, our objects consist of scripts that Goverland deploys, any script you create, software packages that you're deploying through Goverland, external controls, or custom actions. These can all be shared. And there's different levels of sharing, and you can also create repositories of them. So you can see that we have a big repository of software deployment products, and you can see who created them when they shared them. And now when they're shared, um, when I right click, I can choose to make available to my team, which is gonna put a copy of this in, in, the, in the repository. I can share with my team, which will create a copy in all the other Goverland instances in my environment. Or I can enforce on the team, which is going to create a read-only, execute-only copy. So you can't modify it. You can only use it as it exists. And this is great for enforcing some of those controls. So if you want to make sure that, hey, you know, this provisioning template never gets changed, you can enforce it. And then that'll be the one that they use and they can't change it. So the answer is yes, you can export, you can import to other Goverland instances. If you check out our getting started guide at goverland.com slash support under user guides, uh, you'll see the collaboration settings. There's tons of different collaboration features in Goverland that you can really take advantage of. And the most important thing about getting the, this um, sharing system up is the shared data database. This is where all of the packages is the centralized location where the packages are shared, where they're stored, and how you can share them between your team. So as long as all of your Goverland installations are pointing to, these, to this database, you can be the same user and log in to 10 different machines on different locations that have Goverland installed. As long as it's pointing to the same database, Goverland will recognize your username and populate your packages um, that you've created under your own specific uh, user instances. Awesome. Uh, one more question came in about employees being cloned. And um, I would say that no, employees can't be cloned, right? Because we're really performing active directory. Provisioning, yeah. So in this case, what you it, it's more of a general uh, uh, provisioning case. So basically, 
you know, you would, in this case, this user that we're provisioning, we know that we're adding him to some groups that are part of IT and we're putting his department IT, so we'll just put IT department here. And we would create, like I've assisted other clients um, be able to create just standard, um, you know, packages based on the department. Basically. Sure. So you would just. So the the know. answer is what create a custom app, uh, action that performs the clone that you want. So it'll do all the stuff that you want moved from the original user to the new user, and um, and then it'll be available to you to reuse as much as you as much as you like from that moment on. Okay, and uh, I think we are coming towards the latter part of our demo where you're going to uh, take over for me here, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, our two bonus topics. Uh, let's just make sure we covered everything else here. Um, so we did, um, we did the seek and clean on dormant accounts. We did the provisioning. We did the termination. We did all of our uh, demonstrated reports. So we're actually up to querying a logged in user's homepage, Windows theme, and desktop background. Why do I want this? Um, I guess mainly for compliance. You know, compliance specifically. How um, you know there are a lot of companies who set either GPOs out there or or have a specific. Um, company-wide policy that they're obligated to have a specific home page, a theme, and a background against every single machine um, in the enterprise. So, okay. Um, it's very, very important, at least, you know, just a little bonus to be able to do these little um, maintenance and these tidying of your machines as your as being the local admin of your office. And I guess the other cool thing is, is just knowing that this is something you can query and not, not just query, but also manipulate against the remote machine. So, like, I can say, you know, Show me the desktop background of that machine and then maybe change it. So uh, I'll let you drive from here and uh, I'll ask you. Um, yeah, so the first thing I, I, I'm, I would, I'm going to basically place myself as the IT guy in the scenario of having to go ahead and query this information. So, you know, my boss requested that I query every single home page or Windows theme and user background of every currently logged in user right now. I want to see everybody who's actively logged in and what their set is. Now, since this is a basic, it's just a preference, a Windows preference, all of this is located in the registry. So it's a very, very simple report that we're going to build and just telling Doverland, hey, look, this is in the registry where I need you to look, and this is the information that I want you to report back to me. But me, as an IT guy, I don't remember every single registry <laughs> key, every single registry key, so I'm not going to know right off of it, you know, exactly what my home page, where the home page um, key is and so on and so forth. So I literally just do a simple Google search because all of this basic information is already out there um, written by other people. So in this case, I want to query um, the, the current login user's homepage. So I'm just going to say um, registry um, homepage. So you can see the first one from how to geek. Registry hack to set and store Internet Explorer start page. So you can see here that it's HKey current user software Microsoft Internet Explorer main start page how to geek.com. So in this case, I would just open up the registry and verify it, but I already know that um, I've done the verify before and I know that's exactly what key it is. So as you can see, it's an HKey current user key as well, which means that that actual key itself, the HKey current user key, by the way, only um, generates when someone's logged into the machine. So that's the current session. So I would just copy this key, and then I'm going to come over here into Goverland, um, and here we're just going to say home page. We're going to go into the already created action, and here I would just go report user property. I come down to logged in computers, because remember, I am going to a user, and I, I want to query what's his current logged in home pages, instead, as opposed to having to go to a computer that I know he's logged into and querying. So Goverland gives you that versatility. So we're going to go to login computers, and we're just going to go to report, and we're going to go down to registry. Um, and then here, we're just going to go to manage accessible key paths. So we want to insert the specific key. In this case, it would be the IE homepage. We we'll just paste it in, and then we can um, title it as we want. And we don't want to insert any more of the child keys because it's just the actual key itself we have right now. We hit OK. We hit OK again. And now we can go ahead and report that logged in computers registry value, i.e. homepage name. And that's pretty much it. And I did the same for figuring out the wallpaper. You come here, log in workstations. I went on to Google, and I just simply Googled exactly where 
um, their homepage, what was it? Where the, yeah, the wallpaper, the exact uh, Windows wallpaper. So we can do that again here. What is it? Wallpaper. All right, so we can see here that I just went, I Googled and I saw that someone needed assistance and it's in HP current user control panel desktop. And then it's under the actual wallpaper, as you can see here, value. So and that's the same thing I did here. I just went here, report user property, logged in computers, went to the registry, inserted the specific key. This case here, desktop. And that's it. And then here I'm going to go ahead and hit report user property, logged in computers, registry value, desktop, name. And then here in the condition, I need to tell it exactly which is the value that I'm looking for. So the condition will be registry value, desktop, name, and then we just put equal to wallpaper here. And I'm going to open the registry just so you can see how it looks. I don't think you put in the uh, condition in the last one. Yeah, the other one I just recorded. What I want to do though, just real quick, I want to open the registry here just so people can see. How quickly you can see it quick. HP current user. Computers, registry value. Desktop. Okay. So it's HE current user control panel desktop, control panel desktop. So you can see here we gave it a key, which this is the key here. And then the value we're looking for is wallpaper. And then we want the data from exactly what wallpaper is set. And that's what we did here. I don't know if it's case sensitive or not. Or not. No, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but either way, the, the actions are reset. And you simply just double click the action right under it. And we wanted to do it for Aaron Woods, actually, because he was the one that we said. Yeah, he is one. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to query under Aaron Woods because he's currently logged into um, two machines specifically. <coughs> yes. No, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Double yeah, click, right. click, and you just click view more computer info. Okay. There we go. So as you can see here, um, we can see that his desktop is currently winter is coming. Um, the home page that we was the one that I didn't. Too much, I yeah. didn't include that. All right, let me just include it real quick here. So he, he, we didn't add in the condition on the home page. So we have to add in that condition. So we only return the key value that we're looking for, which is, in this case, home page, right? Start page. Start page, page. that's right. So we're just going to do is, is equal to. And Was it start page with a space? Or no, page? I don't think so. Yeah, start page with a space. Okay. Right. So Here's equal to start page. Fault. Let's run it one more time. And you know what? Let's change the report type as well. That's what we want to actually. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. And then we'll query it here. Take on this one. Short. And here we go. So we can see that uh, Aaron is logged into two different machines now, and we can actually verify that in Goverland. So uh, if we double click on logged in workstations, we can see that those are his two logged in sessions. So we can see that he's out of compliance because he has that Game of Thrones wallpaper. I warned you guys. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then um, we didn't actually return the value on start page. So we have to edit that one more time because we forgot to include the value. And then down here, we can see that uh, we included the data as a string here. So we can see uh, what the theme is and it, we can see it's a custom theme. So we'll just edit that one last time and we should have this perfect. And here's, a, again, great part about Goverland is how is the versatility. So. Uh, you know, you're running these reports and you don't get it perfect the first time, so we're just going to go in here and we're just going to modify it slightly. I think it was, no? 
Oh, it was on the All right. Um, we <laughs> we queried the name here instead of the value. Instead so, of the value. Yeah. I.e. home page. Data as a string. So that's that's the one you want to include is data as a string because that's returning the actual key the key data, not the key itself. So, okay. You didn't delete the other one, but that's fine. Okay. Thank you. And we'll just click on view more computer information, and now we should be there. Right. So here we have uh, govland.com. So now tell me what you can do about changing these. So if I want to make sure I'm compliant, um, can I automatically push through a new theme, wallpaper, whatever else? Yeah. So as you can see there, you literally can just add it to that same action. Um, so I come in here, execute action this time. Yeah. Log, Log in, in computers. computers. Registry actions. And then you set a string value. Set a string value. And it's that easy, huh? Yeah. We have the other action if you want here, so I can show you. Okay. Here, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. This one, I'm going to change one page. It's here. So in this case, the only thing we're doing is we're doing the same thing, but in verse. Um, and we're, say, we're setting a string value here. And that's using the same exact string that I did before. Um, but I placed it into Govern and I gave it the value name. It's not expandable, and I put the exact data that I want. So and the case, really cool thing you have here is is what you have going on in the conditions. And then here in the conditions, again, what I did was I said, if this string is not equal to governand.com, then change it. So in this case, we know it is equal to governand.com, so we're just going to say is equal because I want to change it just to govern.com for such support just for the sake of okay. this example. Um, and we don't have to query them. Well, that's going oh, to yeah. verify for us. And then we have a, a verify after as well. So we're just going to change home page. And another nice piece is adding in those little verification reports. And I think we have to run it one more time for the verification to work. There we go. <laughs> so as you All can right. see here, we set the change, and now his start page is now govern.com forward slash support. So I don't know uh, what everybody's use case is, but uh, again, a really nice way for you to manipulate the experience of a logged in user uh, just by uh, updating some, some quick registry values using a bit of uh, Google magic with some Goverland magic sprinkled yeah. on top to. Uh, and, and the reason why we did that was because out of box, if we go to report a specific property, we don't have a built in, you know, as much as we have a ton of different properties that you can go in and query from a machine, we don't have uh, out of box, you know, current wallpaper. So I mean, because those possibilities are exactly, like exactly. I mean, so, there's enough menus on menus here. So uh, just giving you the ability to uh, look at different registry values and set them on the fly is obviously very powerful. Yeah. And uh, that about wraps it up for today. I obviously want to thank everybody for joining us. This has been a great session. Thanks so much for participating with some great questions. And uh, again, next week on Friday, you'll see the link on our homepage probably shortly. Uh, we're going to be doing file and folder manipulation. You want to tease that one a bit and tell us uh, what we're going to see? Yeah, basically, we're going to be um, going over how we can use wildcards to be able to specify against the specific machining. Uh, right now we're in the user space, so we're going to be more in the computer space where we can specify uh, wildcards on folder locations, whether we want to remove a file. For example, when you have those crypto viruses that take over your entire company and they'll infect multiple users' profiles that have logged into that machine. So you can use Goverland to query and use wildcards to find and um, clear out any files, add files, remove them copy and manipulate files locally on a machine or transfer files to machines as well. Cool. So, All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks again for joining us, and I uh, hope to see you at a future webinar.